On today's episode of Kilts of Culture with USA Kilts, we try spay burden bread and orc. Remember, folks, spay and burn your pets. I don't think that's how that phrase goes. Sure. Welcome to Kilts of Culture. I am Rocky. This is Eric. Victorian England had a huge influence on the fashions and styles that were happening in Highland dress in Scotland. Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world, and it is your personal heritage story. Howdy do, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts of Culture. I am Rocky. That's I'm not, Ian. That's not Eric. It's Ian. Today, special treat. We are trying Spayburn uh, Bread and Orc. You have to, uh, the, your, your CHs, you, uh, Bread and Orc. Um, Jim Sheaves gave this to us back in May. So we are going to try this and give you our honest feedback. Other special treat today in the MC chair, we have Miss Emma again. So if they bring her in, there she is, there she <laughs> is. So yes, so anyone who's, any ladies out there, add in the ladies questions, we're gonna be answering all kinds of stuff today. All right, um, so do we, we have the tasting notes for this? I just realized, I don't know. Yes. You got them? Yeah, Sweet. got them all right, right here. Are oh. we getting spayed to review this one? I'll spay you if you keep making that joke. <laughs> Your wife may appreciate it. <laughs> All right, Emma, why don't you give us some, some tasting notes? Yes, yes. Um, so, um, tasting notes for this one. Um, to the nose, we should be experiencing some green apples, honey, lemon, and vanilla. Honey, lemon, and vanilla. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not the usual combination of things you hear about. All right, why don't you come on out here and collect your, your glass. And uh, while you are here, tell us the... Uh, the tartan that you have on today. What do you got on yeah, there? Yeah, this is Buchanan Antique Tweed. Ooh, very nice. Very nice. nice. All right. How about you there, Rocky? What you wearing? I, well, it's, you have to go next then. Oh, I'm, yes. I'm sorry. There's I an order. I'm, There's I'm, always I'm rusty. I'm rusty. I'm wearing yes. the Raylia tartan. Um, yes. Commemorating H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. Lovecraftian tartan. Yes. Yes, indeed. And today I have on my American Dream tartan with my brand new sweater. Nice and cozy. All right. Enough of this. Um, so I wasn't even listening. Green apples, you said, and something yeah. else? Green apples, honey, lemon, and vanilla. I'm smelling the inferior apples. Are we all in agreement that red apples are the best? No, apparently not. <laughs> oh, we can have a fight on the show. <laughs> now, green apples are better for cooking. I don't know what's better for scotch. Depends on what kind of green apples. Um, like, yeah. They're not too sour. I see. I don't. I like the tart. Not sour. Tart. They're tart. All right, okay. the taste is subtle with honey and vanilla, yet full-bodied, creamy and smooth with a long spicy finish, energetic and appealing. This is the brightest member of the Spayburn A range. Definitely hmm. getting the spicy finish. The spicy finish hit me like seven or eight seconds later. Spicy finish, wasn't that your favorite ska band back in the day? <laughs> They were from Finland. <laughs> <laughs> I like how that joke took a second, too. <clears throat> all right, so. All right. I'm not getting the sweet element so much. I am. Hmm? I'm getting a little sweet. Emma, how are you? Are you, are you tasting any? Are you picking up what they're putting down? Um, You know, I don't mind this one, I'm not really picking up much of anything on it. It's it's very, I don't know, su subtle, I guess I would say to me. There's not anything that's like punching me in the face. Not the biggest fan of space side scotches, though. I've grown to like them yeah. a lot more. Um, one of the first scotches we tried on the show was Shield Egg mm -hmm. um, and as, that a customer gave to us. And I really, really liked it. And it's a space side as well, I think. Um, so yeah, it's it's a nice it's it's more balanced. When you're in the mood for a, a mm -hmm. kick in the teeth, you go with a log of oil or an ard bag or uh, something like that. But if you're in the mood for just a nice little, nice little, nice even, mm -hmm. simple, yeah, it's not bad. I wouldn't say space side strikes me as simple as a rule. It just tends to be on the more spicy side. So I don't know. To me, it's it's more mellow. I'll put mm -hmm. it that way. Um, okay. Oh, geez, water really cut the hell out of this. It's yeah. like I made it a cocktail. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, that's that's a lot. Picking up a little bit more on the sweetness now. Yeah. Certainly not overwhelming, though. It is, it's subtle on the sweet. 
and it took out all the all the peppery, you know, mm. spicy finish to me as well. I'm not I'm not picking up on any of the specific sweet flavors. I'm not like vanilla and honey and I forget what the other one was, but just generically a little sweet. Yeah, it's I think that's the honey to me. I'm mm. I'm tasting honey as I'm not like I don't actually like honey. I don't put it on things, mm, I like but I got that. I get that it's a little uh, viscous, kind of like film in the mouth. It's a little bit sweet, and that's the honey kind of hmm. thing to me. Emma, are you getting any of this? Yeah, I would say it's a little bit sweet. It's not eliciting a Jace's face from me, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually, it's more palatable for me than other ones I've tried. So I, I do get a little bit of the sweetness, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I, I, it's not super complex not picking up on a lot of the the individual little notes yeah but it's it's not bad i like it fine yeah no major objections yeah i will have a second glass i like it that much um okay emma score one out one to ten get in there with the decimals tell me yeah i think i'm going with maybe a 6.3 on this oh. one 6.3 okay. okay last time i was on i gave what we had a five and this is definitely more along what i would drink <laughs> than that so 6.3 solid okay. so what normally happens is i give a number and then you scold me and tell me what the rating scale means well now that you tell me i'll, I'll change my answer so what remind me again where are we at eight and above is you would you drive, drive somewhere to get it yeah two and below it's you're gonna refuse it yeah um five is eh, it's fine like yeah seven is like eh, it's pretty good so five is you would buy it but it's just fine or it's like i probably wouldn't even buy it but if it's given to me Cause that's where I'm at. Five, yeah, it's it's more if it's given to you, that's yeah. around a five. Five. If it's if you like it and you would probably purchase it, then yeah. Do we know what it costs? Can we Google what it costs real quick? I would say I'm I'm solid at a five. I'm I'm happy to accept a Jim's gift. It was very kind of him. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I just not blowing me away. Okay. I'll go for something else. I like it more than Emma. I'm not as rude as Ian is. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm gonna go. Seven five, I I enjoy it. I wouldn't necessarily drive out of my way to go get it, mm -hmm. um, but especially with a little bit of water, maybe I poured a few too many drops in. Um, but with a little bit of water, I do like it. Um, it definitely cut down the spiciness, which I'm not a big fan of. So the water helped. Um, but yeah, seven five. Okay, good salad scotch. So there you go. Spayburn, what's it called again? Bread and orach, orach, orach. Yes. Or a high. Indeed. Cool. All right, boys and girls, load in your questions down in the comments. We are but your humble servants here to answer your questions, as always, about anything kilt or culture related. Um, as you load in your stuff, I'm going to go to Ian for one of our uh, pre-asked questions. Yeah, we got a question from Steven Schrader. He says, can we just call this my birthday show since it's the next day? Sure. I'd happy no. birthday yeah, yeah <laughs> but no, i mean no i'm not allowed no um sure happy birthday enjoy here what's his name again steven, steven. Schrader. yeah to steven on another trip around the sun Langeva. okay that was quick let's get into another one fair good job steven jj davidson i got engaged on new year's eve planning on a spring of 25 wedding so he's got some time okay. but i want to lose some weight before then when or how would be the best time slash way to order a kilt for the reception slash we got too many slashes going here reception slash rehearsal dinner probably not going full PC but rather a tweed suit. Okay, so a tweed kilt suit, not a Prince Charlie and tartan kilt. Mm -hmm. All right, um, or even if it's not a tweed kilt, even if it's a tartan kilt and a tweed, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> hitting a moving target on weight is difficult for any kilt for any tailor or any kilt maker. So I would I would take the longest part of the outfit, which frankly for us, frankly, would be the jacket, because we don't yeah. make the jackets now, so we have those made over in Scotland. So if you're gonna get a custom tweed jacket and vest, meaning a you know a specific tweed and specific, you know, uh, accoutrement with the jacket and you want this, you know, this type of cuff, this many buttons and da da da. Um I would start with that and kind of work your way backwards. That's when you want to stop losing weight. So <laughs> if a tweed jacket and vest takes on average roughly 
eight or 10 weeks. I'd add a little bit of time to make sure that the tweet is in stock because if it's out of stock and it's the only one that you want, you're kind of up the creek there. Yeah, um, for sure. So I would I would say if it's going to be eight or 10 weeks, maybe like the 14 to 15 week out mark as a minimum, <clears throat> I would you know make sure you have your order in, done and dusted, um, potentially even a little bit more than that. So spring 2025, we are currently in January 2024. I'd say make sure you, you know, go on your diet, you know, start lifting weights, start running, start doing whatever you're going to do to lose the weight. Um, and then kind of try to plateau, try to hit the the ideal weight and then maintain by end of, uh, end of November of this year. Yeah. So start that, start maintaining and then get your order in for, you know, if it's with us, wonderful. If it's not with the other company, um, by the end of this year. So that way, uh, if it's, you know, end of March, that kind of time frame for the wedding, great. You have three months to, to get it done. Yeah. That's, that's my, my generic advice. Ian, any other thoughts? Yeah. This is kind of repeating what you said, but it just depends on how particular you are. If you know, there's, there's one tartan for me and there's only one example of it. I'll use old Scotland tweet as an example. If that's, that's for me, then you need some extra time built in. Um, if you're like, yeah, I've got like six or seven that I have in mind, or it's a clan tartan that is made by a lot of different mills. You have an opportunity to switch it up. There are some ways to be a little bit more flexible, but yeah, you got to have a particular tweed. You got to, got to get in. Even if you're thinking, well, yeah, the stock Loman blue jacket that you guys have is exactly what I want. It's like, okay, but we could be out of stock on that jacket. If you wait till two More weeks before size. your wedding and yeah. yeah. need time to get it back in. So yeah, the, the size I meant, of course. Yeah. So if we're just out of stock on the size and the other colors aren't going to work, uh, we've run out of time to problem solve. Yeah. So give us some time to problem solve. <laughs> my my favorite example was a, uh, <clears throat> not that this is you, you're planning well in advance and God bless you for it, sir. Mm -hmm. My favorite example was a guy came into the store <laughs> on a, uh, was it a Friday or a Saturday? And he said, Saturday, you know, if it's hey, I'm thinking of, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting married. I want to get an outfit and da, da, da. So I'm like, oh, great. Wonderful. Congratulations. And we went through, you know, picked out his tartan, you know, got his spore and got the jacket. And we're going through the entire process. He's been there for half hour or so. And I, for some reason, it came up in the process. It may have even actually been the jacket. Um, okay. Well, you know, what, when are you getting married? So make sure we get the, the right, you know, color tweet or the right size in stock by that point. And he said, oh, tomorrow. And I was like, oh, then these are your options. <laughs> and he's like, well, what do you mean? I can't get my, I can't get my kilt made in time. I'm like, no, it's, it's tomorrow. It's, we don't have your clan tartan in your weight, in your colorway, in your measurements made ready to hand off to you right now. No, this takes time. Um, so yes, God bless you, sir, for thinking this far in advance. Um, yeah. And when it comes to anything custom, custom clothing and stuff like that, remember this stuff is made just for you, just for your measurements mm -hmm. to your specs. It's part of why it costs so much money is it's custom. It's right. It's right in the name. Um, so yeah, it's, you need to think a little bit in advance and, the closer to your deadline you wait to place the order, the more flexible you may have to be in either the tartan or the weight or the colorway or the jacket or something like that. Gotcha beat. Not to be that guy. We had a guy about two years ago come in the store and we figured it out right away because he led with, do you happen to have my clan tartan, whatever it was, I don't remember, right. in stock. So I'm afraid not. What did you need this for? He was on his way to his own wedding. And he had told apparently his fiance months before that he'd already taken care of it all. And he literally on his way to the wedding was looking to get a whole outfit, not even just the kilt, the whole outfit. So we helped him. We put him in something. Uh, I don't know how upfront he was with his, uh, with his, his wife, or even if the wedding still happened, <laughs> cause that's a bit of a red flag. <laughs> it sounds like the beginning to a long and trustful relationship. Yes. Yeah, so we put him, I forget if we put him in a casual kilt or if we Jesus. found something on the misfit rack. And I, I don't know what her level of knowing the tartan is either. So, Fair point. <laughs> so maybe Fair he point. pulled it off. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. Yeah, she may have just <laughs> wanted to see him in a kilt. And yeah. like that was the thing. Or Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, don't. Don't be don't, that guy. Don't buy a kilt on the way to your wedding. <laughs> yeah. But yes, 
give it a few months, minimum, cool. Sludge. All right, Miss Emma, what do we have out in the, the old YouTube and Facebook land? Yeah, we've got a lot of great questions pouring in, so keep it up. Um, we've got one from a. Paul VC, uh, what do you do to protect inventory from moths and other pit pests? What should I do at home? Okay. Um, a lot of bug zappers. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, luckily, I'm, I'm, I got to knock on wood with this. Um, luckily, we are not in an area where there's a lot of moths and we don't have to worry about that as much. Um, for us here, uh, we have a very good exterminator who comes in every two months and sprays the entire building just to make sure yeah. there are no pests in the building and, you know, we don't have to worry about those types of things, generally speaking. Um, <clears throat> it'd be too expensive a mistake to have a problem when we could have prevented it, so yeah. Yep, that's, that's also one of the reasons why we don't accept customer fabric because if it's been sitting in a trunk or it's been sitting in someone's closet for X number of years and there's moths in it, you know, the moth eggs, and you know, it, if it comes here, it could infect the rest of the building and hell no. Um, it's, it's a very, very expensive mistake. Um, so now in the building, so yes, exterminator. Um, in my house, we have, uh, I have cedar chips in the closet. Um, you could also put your kilt in a, uh, a garment bag or you protect it that way or roll it up and either roll it up or fold it and put it in a cedar chest um, mm -hmm. or in a drawer um, that is kind of, you know, controlled. So, you know, animal or not animals, but you know, moths and things won't get in there. Um, do you have any tricks or tips that you use? I'll start, I'll start with the first part of the question. Um, I would say we don't act, actually have to worry about it excessively necessarily because the, we deal with new material here. Um, and generally what the moths are going for is not the wool. It's the skin flakes and oils and stuff that are sitting on the cloth. So that's what you really need to be careful of. So my tr my tip or trick then is if you're not a serial kilter, you wear your kilt once a year for Burns Night or you go to about one wedding a year, clean it after you wear it before putting it away. <clears throat> that's going to solve a lot of problems. Is it 100% foolproof? Not necessarily. So some cedar chips, you know, the other things you mentioned are, are a good idea. But keep your kilt clean. If you're going to wear it again, if you wear it pretty regularly, it's not quite as, you know, you obviously don't need to clean it every single time. But definitely clean it before it goes into storage long term. That's that's one thing. Good, good point. Um, and that's one thing I've noticed. It's an oddity that you don't have with almost any type of clothing mm -hmm. is when I wear a t-shirt, if I wear underwear or socks or whatever you put on on a daily basis, you throw it in the hamper at the end of the day and you launder it. Mm -hmm. When it comes to kilts, I've noticed a lot of guys will keep their kilts in the closet and then, oh, I'm going to need to wear it in two weeks. And then they go get it dry cleaned before they wear it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't no. understand why that's a thing. You should, you know, you when it gets dirty, you dry clean it and then leave it in the yeah. closet dry cleaned um, in a garment bag or, you know, hung with cedar chips or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then you pull it out fresh and wear it but a lot of guys don't they do it the other way yeah and i i don't understand why that seems to be just a kilt thing I, I imagine if you're putting it in the closet you're hopeful that you'll wear it again soon enough but if you're not yeah if you, if you know you're a once a year kilt guy clean it right after you wear it yeah i would say that helps a lot if it's going to be stored long term yeah agreed yeah all right in okay i got a question from james michael coffin he wants to know what makes kilts unique what makes kilts unique? Yes. Kilts are unique for many reasons. Um, it is, a kilt is the, it, it, there, there is so much symbolism and so much built into a kilt that, you know, you have, you know, the tartan, you know, representing a clan or representing a symbol. You have the fact that anywhere you go, people are going to see a tartan kilt and go, ah, Either he's from Scotland or he has Scottish heritage. It says so much to the world. It says that you're secure in your masculinity. It says that you're okay being a little bit different. It's you're okay standing out for the crowd, as well as you're expressing your family heritage. There are so many different things about the kilt that no other garment that I can think of worldwide representing any culture anywhere has those many different uh, uh, bits of symbolism imbued in it and just screams that every single time you wear it. Yeah. Certainly there's some garments that say some of those things. Yes. Yeah. Some, not all. Yeah. Like all. If, if I wear later hosen, people are going to go, wow, 
he's different. <laughs> and he must be from Bavaria. Yeah. But it's not the same, like, oh, I, and also I know what family, what his yeah. family name is, yeah. or I know different part. you know, it's, yeah. Yeah. I think I'm learning something about myself literally right now as you're talking. Because I, one thing, even when I was younger, I never liked wearing just like brand name t-shirts, like Levi's, American Eagle, you know, whatever. Right. I feel like it's because your clothing should either say something about you or should say nothing at all. And wearing a shirt that just says American Eagle or whatever, like, what does that say about me? And I, I've never, I've never bought into like brand names in that way, at least in a way that I want to project out to the world. <clears throat> but Kilt does say something like, but, but what I'm totally okay with a band shirt or, you know, things that matter to me, like it, your clothes can start a conversation. So, and yeah. Kilt does that in a more interesting and meaningful way to me. Agreed. So I agree. Yeah. Like the, it's, it's an interesting, you know, angle you put on it. I would say there's, um, there are few brands that I feel the need to put on my body yeah. and advertise for. Yeah. Now, if it's uh, like I have like a, a Bauer shirt mm -hmm. and a Bauer jacket. But because, that speaks to hockey, not just the brand. Correct. Yeah. Because I, because I love hockey. Or, you know, if it's, you know, if I'm wearing a Flyer shirt, or like, if I'm wearing a Transformers shirt, yes. or if a band shirt, or a Bill USA. Bong makes more sense to me because that's like a surfing thing. Like if you're into surfing, that, that. You know. Yes, exactly. Or if there's a favorite kilt company, I don't know, USA Kilts, and they have a brand shirt, great, wear one of those. Yeah. Um, no, but if it's if the brand speaks to my soul in mm -hmm. a way, and it's I want to, I I view myself almost as a billboard. So if I'm <laughs> going to, it's either for my personality or for a brand that I believe mm -hmm. in. Um, Origin is a, a a company that has everything it's, that they do is made in America. So I wear Origin T-shirts because I really like the brand and what they stand for. But do I feel that same way about Nike? No. Yeah, I agree I with that. If it's just a brand for brand's sake, not interested. If it's a yeah. brand, like you said, Bauer, it tells people that you're a hockey player. Totally get that. Yeah. Totally get that. Agreed. So and yeah. kilts are very much an extension of that. Even or even just you know, a cable knit sweater. Mm -hmm. Even though this is a, a this sweater, in case anyone asks, because I was asked about my sweater recently. It's kind of weird, but fine. Um, this I got from Joseph A. Somebody Banks. Somebody asking you about your clothes? No, about, about my sweater <laughs> specifically. They really like my sweater in one of the past mm -hmm. videos. This one is a Joseph A. Banks sweater. The only reason I got it is because it has a bit of cabling on it. Mm -hmm. So it kind of speaks to the, the, the flavor that I'm going after. But outside of me you know, telling someone about it in this particular video... No one would care that it's a Joseph A. Banks sweater versus Brooks Brothers versus, yeah. you know, Aaron Knitwear versus Sal Knitwear. It, it doesn't matter, but it's the, the symbolism on the sweater within the knitting that actually matters. So, you know, I, I love having symbolism within the clothing and having it say something about, you know, me as an individual or my likes or my history or whatever. So, yeah, okay. good on you. Good thought. So if I can answer James's question. I thought you did. No inseam. No inseam. What was this question precisely? It was, uh, what makes kilts what makes unique? Them unique? Well, yeah. well, skirts don't have an inseam. Dresses True. don't have an inseam. True. Yeah. True. Most things that you would look at and just see skirt or dress, you, most cases, you're not going to see men wearing them. Yeah. So, that's fair. a kilt. That's fair. It's a little different. No, but it, there's also the, what makes them unique? It is, it's different. You don't see guys yeah. wearing, you know, unbifurcated garments. Yeah. Um, it does say something about the individual mm -hmm. and their security and their masculinity, <laughs> their ability to stand out from the crowd, do something different, their individuality. It says all of these things while saying nothing. That's the beauty of it is you can just be an individual without, you know, having to do much. <laughs> you throw yeah. on a piece of clothing and now you're that guy. All of that, but I'm going to piggyback on that too. I say, when when you shift from wearing torture tubes all the time to your you know unbifurcated garments, um, it makes you really rethink the way you dress yourself. Because I think for a lot of guys, they tend to wear pretty plain bottoms when we're talking about pants. You know, blue jeans or khakis or black dress pants. And then anything interesting is going to come in up here, whether it's a flannel shirt or some kind of pattern, paisley, if you will. Um, so you're kind of reversing the dichotomy. Not that you can't wear patterns up top, but you tend to want to, you know, go a little bit more plain to be a little bit more safe. So you just kind of rethink every part of your outfit. You start rethinking colors. <clears throat> I've had a lot of um, wives and girlfriends tell me, oh my God, he started wearing kilt six months ago. And he's been thinking about colors. He's he's always been a plain t-shirt, 
jeans kind of guy, and now he's thinking about fashion. It's so cool to see him come out of his shell. So, so what you're saying is you need more attention paid to your crotch, <laughs> which is why you wear the kilt. It it really draws the eye. Like I eye. said, no inseam. No inseam, exactly. <laughs> A little bit of mystery. <laughs> yeah. No, it's the and it's it's the the lack of conformity. Going, you know, mm. thinking in different kind of in different ways. The one thing that I always I always find amusing with 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 subcultures. So I'll go up, you know, my subcultures that I grew up in. The you know in 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 the punk rock subculture. You wear a mohawk and a leather jacket and you wear patches and you know zippers on things so that you're anti-conformity. You're doing, you know, what you know, against what the rest of society does. But you're sure. wearing the punk rock uniform and conforming yeah. within the scene. So the I in a way, I'm almost I I want kilts to be more popular. Obvious reasons, because we have a brand, but it's I want them to be more popular so it's more guys can have fun with it. But at the same time, I will lament if it becomes more popular. I will lament the individuality that it affords you as mm -hmm. an individual to be able to be like, "Hey, look, no one else is really doing this in the same way that I'm doing it." If I go out to the mall and I see six other guys in the killer, fifty other guys in a kilt, I'm no longer going to be, "Hey, you're that guy. That's awesome." Uh, it's going to be, "Oh, another one of those, mm -hmm. those kilt wearing guys." Jeez. So as soon as too many people start wearing kilts, you're out of the game, is what I'm hearing. Yes. Then. <laughs> Then micro minis, like okay, different show altogether. <laughs> that's gonna be, that's gonna be where we end this segment. All right, Emma. All right. I now that we're think... talking about me in a micro mini skirt, go ahead. Now that yes. we're imagining it, anyway. I will say that there is some. <laughs> I'm sorry for everyone out there for having to imagine me in a micro mini kilt. There's I mean, Mark. Go ahead. Like Marketing's gonna be photoshopping it. They don't need to imagine it when they see it in post. It'll be there. Uh. <laughs> Uh, people are thanking for the sweater name drop. There have been many compliments on your sweater, so it is eye-catching. Um, so I've got one from Inverness Daddy, who is here. <laughs> he wants to see the micro <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps he does. That's my OnlyFans channel, Inverness Daddy. Um, and, uh, it's getting bad too early. <laughs> this is a, a good one, I think, for, for the new year. Um, Inverness Daddy is asking, greetings from just si outside Inverness, Scotland. He lives up to the name. At I'll least half up, of it. I will be up in your area in about two weeks. Ooh. So, cheers. What? You want to meet up with Inverness Daddy? I'm going to meet up with Inverness Daddy. <laughs> uh, now, if you see me around town, I'll actually be in Inverness in uh, the end of January. Alrighty. Oh, so, Inverness Daddy is asking, what's next for Celtic culture, in your opinion? Ooh. Uh, I, I can't take this question serious. We're talking about Inverness Daddy. Uh, um, what's, what's next, next for, for the culture? I guess maybe Highland wear as in broadly too. That's yeah. What yeah. In. For marled yarns are becoming more popular. That's already well underway. I'm sticking with the culture aspect culture? for now. I'm okay. trying to. I'm trying to get stay with the culture. Okay. Um, I I will say this. Inverness Daddy, my my father of Inverness, um, so weird. The um, uh, I'm not going to speak to Celtic culture because in, in America we're not in Celtic culture. We we experience you know the past more than the current. So what's next for Celtic culture would be better off answered by you and your ilk, as it were. Um, but. Here in America, we would, or, or in the diaspora, broadly speaking, we're, we're looking to connect with family and connect with the foods and the songs and that kind of thing. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of looking backwards, not necessarily forwards. We're looking to yeah. see how our, how our forefathers did it, you know, back in the, in the old country, as it were. Um, so we love, you know, seeing how like Edinburgh celebrates, you know, New Year's Eve or how, you know, it's celebrated on the Orkneys or, you know, the Uphelia festival and things like that. So it's, it's cool to see how it's done, but we are not Celtic culture here. We're looking to how it's done over there now for the culture aspects of it. Um, and we're going to be more looking backwards. We're 150, 200 years behind you. <laughs> in celebrating that yeah. um my great 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 grandkids might celebrate you know what you're doing today um now uh, uh clothing wise 
let's let's kind of spin off and do that a little bit. Um, what's next? I would absolutely say you know marled yarns, as you kind of alluded to a minute mm-hmm. ago, hundred um, percent. Con- more contemporary looks, like what do the kids today? You know, so supreme T-shirt with kilt. Exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. The, gotcha. the Yeezys <laughs> with the kilt, um, <clears throat> or you know, I- incorporating the kilt into different. Um, different types of, you know, fashion-y outfits while maintaining the kilt, the sporin, and or you know, belt and buckle. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that's kind of the core of the outfit. Mm-hmm. And then, but what you do around it makes it more or less contemporary or more or less traditional. Yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, I think people experiencing kilts in new climates is already probably changing some things because people are having to find ways to adapt. Okay. We do regularly have customers lament, I, I can't wear these tweed jackets in the Florida humid heat. I'm like, I get it. This was all designed for Scotland though, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I would like to see for changes in Celtic culture and, 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 and I, yes to everything you said about we're often looking backwards, uh, but sometimes that means pulling traditions or things over here that maybe aren't over here enough. Um, I would like to see more, um, um, uh, wow, I just blanked on the, the name of the beer that I want there to be more of, uh, Scottish, uh, we heavy, the Scottish, we heavy beer is completely being ignored by the craft beer movement. We need more. There's not enough. Hopefully the IPAs are finally cresting and we can finally have at least one or two other styles of beer. Shut your mouth and spit blood. <laughs> nope. More. Scottish wee heavies and just Scotch ales in general would be great. There's there's a good yeah. number of Scotch ales out there, but the the wee heavies we need more of for sure. <clears throat> okay. The I think I think what will end up happening is um, with the casualization of clothing and fashion in general. I think kilts will be not relegated, but will be included in more casual outfits. Yeah. So worn more with sweaters and t-shirts and other things not just relegated to you know full formal outfits that's one thing that i think the diaspora does probably better outside of tartan army better than a lot of people in scotland is they do want to wear it more we're wearing it for different reasons we in the diaspora are wearing the kilt to connect with our family heritage not national pride but a little bit of that and, you know, are, are proud in where our, our ancestors came from, but more proud of our ancestors. I mean, they left Scotland for a reason. They came to America. They went to Canada. They went to Australia for a reason to build a better or different life than they had in Scotland. So <clears throat> the ability to look backwards and honor them while incorporating it into everyday fashion now. Um, when I go to a Highland Games, or a, a Celtic festival. I'm not seeing 800, 900, 5,000 guys wearing tweed jackets and vests. You'll see a few of those, yes, but you'll also see more t-shirts and jerseys and, you know, on grandfather shirts or Highland shirts and things like that because it's our way of incorporating it into our wardrobe and not letting it just stand still. It's not us trying to play pretend Scott for the day. It's us trying to incorporate it into our, our other, you know, types of outfits are the rest of our wardrobe. So it's us incorporating heritage into our wardrobe, not just playing pretend. Yeah. That's my way of thinking about it. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I think that speaks to like, there's a lot of people trying to hike in a kilt. So that's going to change how people are wearing it too. That, Fits right into that kind of yeah. thing. Emma, I'm going to put you on the spot now as well. Yeah. So <laughs> as she groans and makes a noise. <laughs> um, what do you think uh, the future of women's hmm. fashion is within tartans, within kilted skirts, maxi mini middies, within all of it? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think there's an exciting future uh, that's coming about. Um, I think... More and more, at least from what I've seen and connected with with folks that we've had here, uh, more and more women are becoming interested in getting kilts and wearing kilts beyond just matching their partner's uh, kilt, uh, wanting to coming in to get maybe their husband a kilt, but then also wanting to know their own heritage and, and what tartan they and then deciding to get a kilt, too. So I think. I think what's exciting is the more people you have drawn into Highland wear and, and who are interested in wearing kilts, 
uh, and and Celtic culture, the more uh, broad uh, of takes we get on it. So the yeah. more people that that come in, I feel like there have been a lot of new fresh people in. Um, the more um, the the more uh, the more exciting things happen. So I think that's a really cool um, aspect of it, and I think that's where it's going. I think we're gonna see uh, a lot more ladies in kilts and. I think I've, I've noticed some more ladies in kilts on kilts and culture too, mm-hmm. um, being a little sure. bit more active, carving out a space there. So keep it up. I would say it's it's going good places. Yeah, when you when you when you take the the garment out of it and you just think about tartan itself, it is a representation of, or it can be a representation of your family heritage. You know, <laughs> tartan is Scotland's gift to wor- to the world, and it is your personal family heritage, and it's your story. So the ability for women to be able to wear a sash or a purse or a skirt or whatever in tartan matters as much to them as it does to men. It doesn't have to be a male exclusionary thing. Not that it is, but it doesn't have to be. And it's a big tent. And women will want to express their own heritage in the same way that guys do. And I don't know why we don't think about it in that way enough. Hmm. Um, But it's, you know, it's it, tartans for everybody. You can you can wear tartan whether you're man, woman, beast, or otherwise. It's you know it's great to be able to you know have fun with it in a fashion way as well as a traditional way. You don't have to relegate it to formal Highland wear. Period. It's great, and that is the stalwart. That is the well that everything comes from. It is important that that it exists and that it is drawn forward. And you're always going back to that period. But you can do other things with it as well. And in doing that, in playing with it, in having fun with the fashion and incorporating it into your daily life, that's where it has legs. That's where it will be drawn into the future. And as long as you're going back to that same well of tradition, you're you're inspired by the core, by a good thing. To broaden the topic back to culture, and I'm going to come around to linking this to the next question too. <clears throat> I think uh, for Celtic culture in America, I think Burns Night is having a really big moment. Like I think tens if not hundreds of times more people are at least aware about it and curious about it than even a decade ago. So I think uh, seeing how that evolves over time is going to be really interesting. Agreed. And I think that that is a, I'm separating that from the next question on purpose. Fair enough. Um, I think that Burns Night's um, potentially the, the little bit of a boom that we're having in Burns Night's could be a post 2020 COVID type yeah. thing where people were starved for things to do. And now like, Ooh, Hey, let's do this thing or yeah. do that thing. And in, in COVID people started doing more family research and things that you could do on your own, in your home, not out in the public. That's and right. now that you have that data and maybe some more people connected with their Scottish heritage, then they say, Oh, okay. Hey, this Burns night is a thing. There's one local to me. Let's go do that. And so. there's goofballs on YouTube talking about it. <laughs> that wasn't planned at all. Actually, it wasn't. So, all right. Okay. Next question, Ian. Next question is from good friend David Barr. We are going to our first burn supper later this month. I have a full American dream tartan suit and kilt vest and jacket. Is that too much for the occasion? I do not have a PC yet. Things keep getting in the way. I do have a Kilkenny I can wear, though. Okay. So, how do you want to tackle this one? I want to tackle David Barr for many reasons. <laughs> that Paisley shirt's the first reason. <laughs> the um, <clears throat> So, going to a Burns night and wants to know how formal or informal to be is a full tartan kilt suit too much for a burn supper? Depends on the burn supper. Yeah. I, uh, some burn suppers are very formal others are very i wouldn't say casual but more smart day wear and probably down to smaller like home-based ones where it's like yeah i'm gonna invite 15 people over to my house kind of thing that's more casual probably um so the if it is i would say look at the invitation and look at the you know the data for the event itself if it says it is a black tie event then a Prince Charlie is going to be, or a black jacket is going to be the right way to go as as formal as you can be. Now, 
the uh, using Philadelphia St. Andrews Society as a bit of a, a bellwether here. Um, they have formal events, typically for uh, for St. Andrews Day in November. Their burn supper is a little bit more raucous, a little, little more scotch. Um, well, they have a lot of scotch at all their events, in fairness. Um, yeah. But it is more smart day wear. You're going to see tweeds. You're going to see nice type outfits, but not formal necessarily. So it really depends on the people at the event and that are planning the event, what they are willing or wanting to do. Now, if this is your first burn supper or the first times at this particular burn supper, I would say check the invitation or check the Facebook invite or whatever it is, or the website. Um, if they don't mention anything, then look at the photos. If they have mm. done it for multiple years, go back to the 2023, 2022, 2021 versions of the event and see how the rest of the people are dressed. If everyone there is in a black jacket and a bow tie, then okay, fine. Maybe wear your Kilkenny with a bow tie or a solid black tie or something like that. If there are a bunch of different levels of outfits, then sure, have at it. Wear your your mm -hmm. over the top, you know, uh, full American dream kilt suit. Yeah. And decide how much you want to be a peacock at an event you're going to for the first time. I guess it depends on how old you know the people. Even if you're not, maybe maybe you know these people and you haven't been to their event before. Um, are they open to that level of individuality? Peacockery. Peacockery, if you will. Yeah. Um, and if you don't know, maybe it is probably safer to go with the more safe option, the Kilkenny, or even acquiring that PC finally. Um, but yeah, if everybody's... You know, if you see in those pictures, there's a guy in a red velvet argyle, and there's another guy in a tartan PC, and another guy wearing a, a tweed Inverness cape, and, and and people are really peacocking it up all over the place. There's peacocks as far as you can, yeah, of course, wear that American. There's everywhere. <laughs> the, I was trying no. not to go that far. <laughs> you haven't met me. Uh, no, it's, that's a good point, though. But it's, you're, in wearing a full tartan kilt suit, you are... The, the king peacock in a room of peacocks. So just, I would, to your point and to reinforce your point, um, if it is your first time going there and you don't know everybody, then maybe tone it down a little bit just to be safe. You don't want to be seen as that guy, the guy who's looking for all the attention. I know David Barr. It, it depends on your willingness to ruffle feathers too. Yes. You know, would you be scandalized if everybody thought you stood out too much? If you don't care, <laughs> it's a different story. If this is a group you're trying yeah. to join, you know, maybe go a little more conservative. Yeah, I would I would potentially yeah. go a little more conservative the first yeah. time. And then once you get to know some people and yeah. it's, or if there's a lot of guys in some over the top outfits, then yes. Yeah. Um, but it's, I'll, I'll draw a bit of a parallel. In, in what I tell people is, uh, what I tell people is if you're going to a wedding and, or to an event, and there's going to be dozens of guys in kilts, and you know you know everybody there and you're an outgoing you know out there type personality you know loud and proud then sure wear the full tartan kilt suit if you're going to a wedding and it's your you know second cousin's wedding or it's a friend of a friend kind of thing or it's your wife's cousin's wedding they don't really know you personally per se um and there may not be other guys in kilts then I would say just wear tone it down a little bit. You want to kind if of your personality is a bit more introverted and a little bit more like nervous in that new environment. Yeah, where you're going to draw attention to that. <laughs> yeah. So, well, if in fairness, if your if your personality is more introverted, you probably wouldn't wear a full tartan kilt suit anyway. Yeah. Um, unless you're the type of person trying to substitute your, your personality with clothing. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Which I don't think David is. So what he's saying, David, is you have no personality at all. You are the milk toastiest <laughs> white dude that we've ever met. I think I think David is, uh, not to get too personal on this question, because we're trying to make it universal for everybody, but I don't think David's at either of the extreme extrovert. I'm the 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 king of the walk. I'm, I'm, yeah. I want to be the center of attention. I want everybody looking at me, but he's also not the introvert. He's not that guy. Yeah. No, but, but it's, you know, try to, it, when in doubt, tone it down a touch. Yeah. If you know what you're doing, you've worn it a dozen times, and you know everyone involved in the pro, in the in the event, and you know the personalities that are in the room, and you and they're loud as well. Sure, have at it. And if there, if after all that advice, you're still on the fence, you're not quite what sure, sure 
not quite sure what to do about this event. I would say, were you invited by an individual? Like, is it a friend of yours? He's like, hey, come on out to our burns tonight. Check in with them. Like, quiz them. Find out where where this specific event lands on the spectrum of all these different possibilities we've we've created and, and kind of narrow down whether, you know, what, what makes most sense for you. Agreed. Cheers. But long story short, Burns Nights can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I said cheers. Sorry. That minute was over. Sorry. You've, you've, you've ruined the entire show. Ian. Yeah, I guess we just need to Son end it here. All right. <laughs> Miss Emma. Okay. All right. I, I think I've got a pretty fun question here from Jennifer Jordan. Uh -oh. um, she wants to know what else is there for a woman to steal from a man's wardrobe? Okay. So some ladies wear centric. Interesting. What can... A woman to steal. Like, would she steal a kilt from pen? a man's wardrobe? Would she steal a Highland shirt? Would she steal, would she do some kind of tartan jacket and vest? Like, now are to we match talking... David Barr? Steal from a man's wardrobe. Yeah. All right, I'll let you start, Emma, because I'm going to see how you interpret the question. Yeah. Is it how to dress as a man or just one accent piece for her outfit dressed feminine? Yeah. Yeah, when I go for theft, I usually go for <laughs> armed robbery. That's my kind of basis. So, Jennifer, I know where you're coming from. Wallet. Yeah. That's what you steal first, of course. <laughs> And then the phone so they can't call for help. Yeah, cash, really, so <laughs> yeah. it's not traceable. Then the phone, yeah, indeed, okay. Um, I like so the I'm... viewers are getting to see her dark side a little bit that we get to see a little bit of every day. I'm thinking <laughs> she's coming at it from, like, you know, sometimes you'll steal your partner's hoodie or a shirt or oh. something like that. So literally from um, their closet. From their closet, okay. yeah. What would I okay. take if I had someone's whole kilt wardrobe? Um, kilt okay. pin is a base answer, I think, that Yeah. Okay. ladies wear kilt pins all the time. Um, I would take my grubby little hands and grab a grandfather shirt, actually. Okay. Uh, I like the grandfather shirts. Um, I think they're really nice, and they go with... When I wear a kilt, sometimes I'll, I'll put one on. Uh, they're answer. super comfortable. Um, some interesting thoughts, if, if you would take a sporin. I don't typically wear sporins, but I know there are some women who do, and, and that might be worth stealing. That's a high price item. <laughs> Um, to build out your collection. You also stole my answer. Damn you. Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. Just name all the parts of the outfit. Sorry, and no, leave nothing no, for I, us. That's it's it. It's fine. I'm we done. weren't planning to answer any of these questions. Just go ahead, Emma. That's all I'm stealing. It's the Emma show today, boys and girls. <laughs> go ahead. Theft is, yeah. No. Um, anything else you would like to add to your theft no, my bag is full. That's that's that's, that's, that's enough crimes. I don't want to get to larceny, you know. So that's fair. That's yeah. over five thousand. If it's not a federal yeah. crime, is it even worth it? <laughs> that's fair. Um, what would you, what would your I, wife steal from your outfits? It's a good question. I've been with my wife since longer than I've been wearing kilts, and I've been wearing kilts a darn long time. Um, there's nothing that she's specifically stolen from me. I like the grandfather shirt answer though. That is kind of the Highland wear equivalent of the stealing the stealing yeah. the boyfriend's hoodie. Not that, um, yeah. I don't know that I have a great answer for this one. I'll, I'll pass to you, Rocky. Okay. Yeah. Um, the I I will I will say I do not encourage theft, but perhaps to borrow. Mm. A, an inspiration from a man's outfit. Um, I would say the one thing to play with it in a fashion sense is uh, I could see women playing with sports. So the the biggest hurdle in this regard, in my estimation, to making it look good is the size of the sporin. Yeah. If you are a smaller frame, an average frame woman or a smaller frame woman, then maybe look at a kid sporin, like an extra large kid sporin versus a full male, you know, a full adult male sporin, um, because it it just proportionately looks a little bit better on the frame. You know, it, it doesn't you know it, it doesn't draw your eye. It doesn't look too big for the outfit. Um, that's kind of the one that I would say um, a kilt pin, um, potentially a cap badge if you're going to wear a a sash and you don't want to have too ostentatious a brooch or if you don't like the brooches that a particular company has maybe wear a cap badge as a, mm -hmm. a brooch for your uh for your sash that's like kind of where i would go yeah something like that um yeah. maybe 
maybe kill toes, maybe. Um, the cap like, patch is a good idea though, because you can incorporate that into other outfits too. Like whether it's you know a shawl of some kind, whether it's tartan or not. Yep. Yeah. But I could see maybe if they were like high boots, especially if you have like the the Lewis hose, like something with a, a mm-hmm. nice pattern on the top from a company like House Cheviot that offers like Rannick hose and Lewis, like a bunch of different patterned tops that also make shooting socks. Something like that as a turnover for the top of like riding boots or a high yeah. a high pair of boots. Maybe that could work well. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm going with it. If we're literally stealing from his closet, I don't know if <clears> the <throat> hose or not. I guess it depends on that. If he has couple. a pair of Lewis yeah. hose. Yeah. 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 If they're close enough in size, though, that, that, that's something to be concerned about, too. Yes and no, because if yeah. it's a, let's say he's a size large and she's a size medium or small, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> if she's wearing it in a pair of high boots, mm-hmm. then it won't matter as much because A, the, the, the heel is going to go up, but it won't matter because it's hidden by the fact she's wearing boots anyway. It's it's tucked in the boot. Fair enough. Ha-ha. Uh-huh. Fair enough. I win this round. I'm uh, picking up what you're, what you're stepping you're in You're catching there. what I'm throwing. Yes. Indeed. It. Indeed. I yeah. will say uh, Jen Barry is here, and she's saying go right for the flask. Take his oh, flask. Oh, okay. Uh, and make well, sure it's filled, actually. Well, you can share <laughs> If he that. has a flask. Yeah. And if he doesn't, why are you with him? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, flask, other accessories, <clears throat> maybe also a not take his actual wallet that he needs, but you know, a a wallet with a a you know Kilting Knot inspired thing. Maybe you could leave do. him twenty bucks so that he can get some cab fare back home. Fair, you know? fair. Why you call an Uber? It's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, no, flask is a good answer. I like that one as well. But if he doesn't have his phone because you took it, so he couldn't call for help. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> Shillelagh and beat him with it. There you go. All right. We're encouraging spousal abuse here on today's episode of Kilts and Culture. So uh, leave the comments, uh, send the comments to Ian at USA Kilts. <laughs> Indeed. All right, next. So was that question from Jennifer Barry or was that just somebody who piped in on that, on, on the answer? Jennifer Barry had uh, piped in on that one, I believe. Okay. Because okay. interestingly enough, my next question here from Jennifer Barry ah. had uh, shared with this in advance of the show. Um, from a respecting heritage standpoint... Is it acceptable for a woman to wear a man's great kilt in her family tartan? Is it acceptable for a woman to wear a man's great kilt in her family tartan? Um, For this, I think we should ask first, let's bring in Emma. Emma, do you think it is acceptable, Um, allowable, permissible even? Yeah, I mean, I I do not have any problem with it. I think it's a fun idea. I've seen some women do it before. Would you um, do it? I don't get into the great kilt thing so much. I they look awesome. I don't have that much time to <laughs> put something on. Um, so if you have the time to do it, um, I think it it is very cool. Um, there are some things that I would think about when when going about doing that. Um, one that we do have air eris- stitches. Uh, on our website, um, but uh, they, they're more like an overskirt to go over top of something, mm-hmm. um, and they're not necessarily meant to be pleated and worn without something underneath the way a gray yeah. kilt would they're be. They're not complete enough of a garment. Yes, yes, so you definitely would want to go with higher yardage so you could get all those pleats, um, but then still keeping in mind, depending on how large your frame is, like it, it does, it is a lot of fabric when you're, when you're getting a gray kilt. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say, yeah, go for it. Uh, it could be uh, fun, and and there are definitely some ladies out there who are doing it and doing it well. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, I agree. I don't think that there is a an issue with it. Um, if you would, also, and this is going to be a bit cumbersome potentially, but if you would also, it depends on the look you're going for. If you would, if you ever would consider wearing an Arasich. The difference between the Arasich, uh, it's it's you know it's spelled Arasade, but it's pronounced Arasich. If you would ever consider wearing an Arasich as well as a great kilt, what I might do is at the same time get a four yard great kilt, mm-hmm. and then you'll be able to essentially fold it in half to wear it as an Arasich, but it would be doubled, so it'd be a little bit more weight. Um, bulky, <clears throat> indeed, it would be bulky. Yes. So the question becomes, are you wearing a great kilt um, because you want it to be a masculine look versus a feminine look? Because an aerostitch is feminine. You're wearing an underskirt with it. A great kilt, 
you're not wearing an underskirt. It's just or under anything. You're just wearing it you know, and you know pleating it up in the back and having the flat aprons in front. So <clears throat> it's a different garment entirely. Um, so it is more masculine. I don't think that you, the family tartan aspect, I don't think matters. If someone's going to have a, a problem with it, air quotes, it's because it's a woman wearing a man's thing. But at the same time, it's, it's, you're playing with it with fashion. So, uh, you know, societally speaking, people are generally more forgiving of women playing with men's fashion than they are men's playing with men playing with women's fashion. Um, so I don't have a problem with it. I don't think most people would, some people might, but eh, then that's their problem. It's yeah. you playing with your family heritage and your fashion in your way. I mean, Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world. It is your personal family story, your heritage story. So do with it what you want. Play with it how you want. You can incorporate, you know, your family, you know, tartan into your kilt, whether it's a grid kilt, whether it's a long skirt, whether it's a short skirt, whether it's a man's length kilt. Women play with fashion in a different way than men do. Yeah. Ian. I would say I want to be careful not to put all women into a box and be like, yes, this answer is true for all women or it's not true for all women. Um, you know, certainly people... Women too, somehow. <laughs> Women um, are people. They come you in. Don't say. They, they come in different shapes, sizes, gender expressions. So I would just say that, like, it depends on how much you're trying to mix things. It's going to work well better for some women than for others. Some of that you have control over, and some of it you don't as much. Like, if the rest of your look has a very <laughs> feminine vibe to it if you've got your makeup done and your hair done and you've picked a top that are all very feminine just throwing a great kilt on top is going to feel weird weird disjointed yeah if your yeah. overall look is a more unisex style look it might work a little bit better that's where i'd land on it i think yeah i agree and it also depends i'll, I'll expand it a little bit and say are you wearing it in a historical type look context um is are you doing a reenactment type thing or are you wearing it more contemporary with a t-shirt and a great kilt mm -hmm. versus a, a an old timey shirt and the Rob Roy type bag and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. So it depends on how you accessorize and how you're wearing it and presenting yourself overall, whether androgynous, whether masculine, whether feminine um, versus a, you know, it, it, or is it a costume? So there, there's a lot of different unanswered things here. Um, if you're looking for a masculine, ma you know, warrior type vibe, then Sure. How about it? You know, Boudica in a man's you know, great kilt. Yeah. Go for it. Um, if you're looking for a slightly more feminine thing, then I would say in agreement with you, then no, I wouldn't do that. I would wear it, you know, a more feminine top with an Arasich, not mm -hmm. a great kilt. So. Yeah. Agreed. Cheers. Okay. Hope that helps. All right, Miss Emma. <clears throat> yes. Um, got a question here for... From um, Brian Graft, um, and he is asking, "What do you suggest for sporn straps for larger guys who don't like sporn hangers?" I have a mm. 60 inch waist, and I struggle to find sporn straps long enough. And this is something that mm -hmm. we encounter in the store a lot. Maybe sporn hangers <clears throat> don't do it for you. Strap yeah. will work better, but sometimes it tucks under that pouch there. <clears throat> I have an answer, and I don't think it's a great answer. No, I know what you're going to say. I don't think you know what I'm going to say. Oh, no. Okay. I'm sorry. Pal. This guy. Um, the So, 60-inch waist. You want to wear a small inch strap. Here's the problem. The, the actual logistical problem is that cow hides, and we run into this with kilt belts as well, cow hides are only so wide. So, when we go to our sporn maker and say, hey, or our, our belt maker and say, hey, I want to have, you know, here's my size range belts I need to order. And I want to order, you know, something that above a 57. They will tell us mm, above 57, you know, because there's a fold over on the end of the belt, yada, yada, yada. Um, it, we can't do it consistently. We can't give this to you every single time necessarily. So how we get around it for kilt belts is we actually have them sew two small belts together. And then we have a what we call a double long kilt belt. 
it costs us an arm and a leg more because they're literally sewing two belts together. So they charge us essentially double what we'd normally pay for a kilt belt. And then we have to charge a lot more for that end as a finished product, but we can get something for bigger guys. So my thought would be having a kilt, a, a sporin strap ordering two size small okay. sporin straps and connecting the belt and buckle from one and then uh, maybe uh, because they, the, the holes on our sporin straps span about 10 inches, maybe connect the, the belt and buckle from one to the, or the buckle from one to the belt from the other, maybe trimming off the end of it and then putting that behind the sporin to hide it mm-hmm. and then connecting the other bits in the back. That mm. will get you a much longer yeah. range or a much wider range for your sporin or for your sporin strap than you otherwise would. So that's my thought on okay. you know, essentially just ordering two smalls or two mediums, whatever the, the numbers add up to, to make sure that it's long enough for you in a sporin strap. Um, and then I would also point out that what you wanna do is on the side of the kilt, I'm gonna shift a little bit to the side here, um, on the side of the kilt, it's where the sporin pop. strap above the buckles on the side of you, so that way it hangs down nice and even in the front and it's not kind of underlining the belly, but it is, you know, going up and hanging down from the sides, not from the center back. And it doesn't underline the belly. It just hangs nicely in the front. Ian. Yeah, because I think you're going to run into a lot of the same issues with the strap that you do with the chain in that undercutting topic. For the record, that was like 90% what I thought you were going to say. It's an uncomfortable topic, but... It's a good solution. I hadn't thought of putting two straps together. That was half of my yeah. answer. That wasn't ninety well, percent. That was maybe fifty percent. <laughs> but in any case, um, yeah, with that, with the those belts you described, where we it's essentially two belts. There is a visible join. It's not terrible, but it's not great either. And I just I'm concerned with the thinness of the, sh- the straps. To have that done wouldn't hold up. It might come apart. So doing putting two together is a really good idea. I like that a lot. Thank you. He yeah. has nothing else to add. I've not beaten particularly. him. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Cheers. Ian. Okay. I've got a question here from Colin McLaughlin. Hope I said that right. McLaughlin. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Uh, is that FF? Nope. Nope. I'm, you're right. McLaughlin. Yeah. Okay. I'm considering cutting a yard off of my great kilt. Apparently, this is a whole great kilt show. It's the all great kilt all the time. Yeah. As there is simply too much material, are there any notable do's or don'ts? Mm-hmm. I should know about before I do this. And what can I make with that extra yard of material? I'm thinking of a sash for my sister. Okay. So you got a great kilt, too much fabric. Yeah. You want to chop it down. All right. Let's start with the do's and don'ts of cutting down a great kilt. Mm -hmm. All right. So some practical like sewing, cutting. Yes, indeed. All right. So, Uh, I'm, I'm a, let's under, we're going to work under the assumption that he bought the fabric from us or from a company that has provided Scottish wool cloth or, or yes. cloth woven in the UK in their tartan. So that way we know it. it's not like Walmart fabric where we don't know if it's a plain weave or a twill weave or something like that. It's important. So let's, let's assume that it is a twill weave. This is important for what I'm about to say next. So. Let's say you have a five yard great kilt and you want to make it a four yard great kilt. Great. Um, and you're going to leave the ends cut or fringe the end a little bit. Okay. So <clears throat> take a scissors. This is the scary bit. Take a scissors and cut at the four yard mark. Measure twice, cut once, boys and girls. Um, measure out four yards, make a little chalk mark, verify it's correct a hundred times before you cut it. Once you cut it, you can't uncut it. And then you're going to cut at that four yard mark, let's say two inches into the cloth. Now, twill cloth will rip straight. So once you have two inches cut in, grab this side of the cut and the other side of the cut with your hands firmly and rip straight apart Literally as fast as I just did. Don't 
pull it slowly because when you pull it slowly and you're pensive in your ripping, you're actually going to let the fibers and the individual strands of wool kind of pull and stretch. And then you don't end up with, you end up with like puckering on either side of the, of the cut. So grab it, you know, do the old, you know, Hanukkah, Danica, grab it and rip as fast as you can. And it will rip straight. I promise you. The only time where it gets a little bit weird is if you're ripping like near the end of a bolt of cloth. So if it's like you're rip, you you want to cut yeah. two inches or so off of the end of a piece of fabric, then it can get a little bit wonky because when you pull fast, some of the fabric or some of the fibers may just release and then you end up with like, you know, this kind of looking thing on the end. But if you're ripping straight down the middle of a bolt or, you know, let's say six inches in or more into the center of the bolt of cloth, just grab it and rip as fast as you can. You want to start it with a two inch or so notch, not notch, but you know, a singular straight cut. And when you pull it, I promise you it'll go straight. Yeah. Ian, your thoughts. So yes, it's important to consider that that piece of material is going to have nice kilt salvages, assuming we're still talking about Scottish cloth sourced from us or somewhere else. It's going to have nice kilt salvages on the long edges. The short edges, we give you a choice of how they're finished. You're probably going to want both sides to match. So if we hemmed the short edges for you, do you have the skill to hem that yourself or do you have somebody who can do it for you? Um, something to pay attention to because I want to open up to the possibility they got this great kilt elsewhere. Did the, uh, Whoever made it, did they tear it or did they cut it? And if it's cut on one side versus torn on the other, is that going to bother you? Would it, it probably shouldn't bother me because they're so far apart from each other. And one's under on the yeah, other one's side. Under, one's, yeah. It shouldn't bother me, but I'm picky and it would. <laughs> so now, okay, well let's 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 You can cut this. two, but it's a much cleaner. Not that the other one's not clean. It's that's not a great way to put it, but correct. But here's there's there's a reason why you rip cloth versus mm -hmm. cut cloth. If you cut cloth, okay, and by cut cloth, I mean, you know, you're following the tartan line straight across the bolt and, you know, snip, snip, snip all the way across on a perfectly straight line. <clears throat> that is much easier to fringe because it just, you know, the fabric or the, the, the individual strands of, of wool will pull out much easier as you're going across. Now, when you rip the fabric, it's a little bit more difficult to fringe. So it'll actually, in, in a weird way, kind of like lock it in. It's not going to unravel. It's not a knit like a sweater where if you get a pull and you pull the whole thing, it's just going to and just disappear. Do not pull this thread as I walk away, to quote <laughs> Weezer. As I walk away, as I walk away. Um, so, but it will, you know, have you will have an easier or harder time fringing the fabric, fringing the edge if you rip it versus you cut it. So if you cut it, it's easier because it's a nice clean cut edge, clean cut literally, um, versus if you've torn it, then it's going to be a little bit more difficult to fringe effectively. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. <laughs> um, <laughs> So what was the other question that he wants to make stuff from it? So yeah. what are we going to make from that extra yard of cloth? Before we get into that, I want to give him one more tip. Okay. So if let's say it's, he didn't tell us a specific number of yards, but if you're going from five to four, let's, let's assume that. Who cares if it's four yards and three inches or three yards and 11 inches? What I would say is fold it over to four yards, clip it in some way, binder clips or something, wrap it around yourself, see if you like it. And then, you know, okay, actually, I really wish I had four more inches you can still do that. It's not too late. You haven't cut it yet. So that's part of that measure twice, cut once thing. Fair. It, yeah. It's really more the depth of the pleats mm -hmm. um, and, and or if they find it's just a bit too cumbersome wearing the extra, you know, piece of cloth. Just don't get caught up on being whole numbers, you know? <laughs> I 100% I yeah. agree. Um, and don't just, be afraid to even just shift it an inch either way just to get to a better, cleaner line if, if, if you do decide you want to cut it all the way across. Or if your OCD is such that you mm -hmm. absolutely need to have this end of the bolt oh, yeah. match that end of the bolt. So yeah. this one has a white stripe one inch in from the end. And if I cut it at four yards, I'm just cutting off the white stripe. No, add an inch, allow yeah. that, you know, don't, don't freak out later on about your OCD that I would. Yeah. Um, yes. But yeah. 
think twice, cut once. You know, so make sure you're hundred percent sure about where you want to cut it. Yeah. Now, what are we gonna make, make from it? Yeah. with the other bolt or with the other yard of cloth? Emma, we'll bring you in for this as well. Mm. You're you're crafty. You're apparently Colin's I've heard. sister. Yes. <laughs> so what would you make from a yard double width, so fifty four to sixty inches wide, of cloth with a bit of scrap? Yeah. Um I'm going with a little pillow for my couch. Oh, I would make a cute little nice. pillow. A little throw pillow? A little Very throw nice. pillow. I've made, with some scrap from my kilt, I've made a little bandana to match uh, this kilt that I'm wearing, my Buchanan antique tweed. Uh, but that is a little bit of fabric, and you've got a whole yard. So, uh, But yeah, I think I'm going to go a pillow, a little a little piece of decor. I'm, I'm a big home decor person. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. But yeah, extra yard of cloth. I think he, Colin had suggested a sash for his sister. I think that's not a bad idea as long as you have the skill to uh, join two pieces together and and um, you know Splice put it. a put a yeah. hem put a hem on it. Um, it's a good option. Um, I had another thing in my head and it is oh a, a table runner for your burn supper that you're hosting would be another good way mm. to go. Similar technique for the uh, for the sash. Yeah, there's there's a lot of home projects that people can yeah. do like. If you're if you're the type that's if you're crafty and you make teddy bears, you can make a teddy bear for your you know for your son or your daughter, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to grow up with a little piece of their family tartan, and you know it can become part of your family's your family's lore, your family's heritage, your family's you know pass it down type things. Yeah. Um, think about the things that were passed down in your family that were given to you, and try to create that for your kids. Um, so if there's a, a wedding gown or a sash, like, like, just think about like, what are the things that could mean something later on? Something mm -hmm. that's not disposable. That's not just a fashion thing. That's not just a, you know, a, something that's going to be thrown away, but something that could mean something and then do that with it. That's kind of where I'd go with it. I like that. Okay, I do have a great question lined up, but I think we have a kilt ambassador. With oh, a fantastic we've gone mustache. way over time. Whoops, that's not my fault. Don't want to deprive so, uh, the world of let's, that. Let's go ahead and do that part. Our ambassador to this month is Matthew Moreland. Matt hails from San Antonio, Texas, and is a man of many passions. Making music, growing a social media following, kilts, professional sports, as well as Disney films. He's even developing his own podcast. His subject is Disney movies and the stories that they're based on. Matt has Celtic heritage on both sides of his family. On his dad's side, McLeod of Lewis, and on his mom's side, McDonald. It may be that Matt inherited his passion for his Scottish ancestry from his grandmother, who is also very passionate about the family's heritage. And Matt has been carrying that torch by tracing his family tree and doing DNA testing. He says, knowing my heritage means knowing where I come from. Remembering that my own ancestors came here from other countries to build a better life makes me respect anyone who takes that risk, in the past or the present. Matt's been fascinated by the kilt ever since he was little. The cool factor, the uniqueness, it really just spoke to him. Matt got his first kilt back in 2013 at a Highland Games Festival, and he just fell in love with it. As he puts it, while people wear the kilt more than they used to, it's still not something you see every day. And it's a way that I can stand out a little bit and be different while bringing joy to complete strangers. He brings that joy to strangers through his social media accounts. Matt's most active on TikTok as Matthew the Red, where his content is eclectic and fun. He posts about kilts, philosophy, and silly stuff too. Matt is also a huge sports fan, especially when it comes to basketball and baseball. And naturally, his favorite teams are his local San Antonio Spurs and the Houston Astros. Now, a fun way that Matt combines his passions for sports and heritage is by wearing the kilt with his team jersey when he goes to games. He has a few dozen kilts and is the proud designer of not one, not two, but three custom Spurs-inspired tartans. He's got a few kilts in the works, and he's going to show them off at NBA home games that he attends. But wait, it gets better. Matt and his girlfriend are also super fans for the Houston Astros baseball team. Now, Naturally, Matt had to make a custom Astros-inspired tartan as well. He and his girlfriend are planning a U.S. stadium tour, following the Astros around to as many ballparks as possible during the 2024 season. Now that sounds like a hell of a road trip. I'm trying to imagine being a 24-7 tailgater. Hmm. 
kilts, beers, burgers, and bago at every MLB stadium across the country. Now that sounds like a life choice I can get behind. So here's to Matthew Moreland, our Kilt Ambassador of the Month. So, little cheers to Mr. Matthew Moreland. That man has more freaking tartan designs. And he is, he, I think he has like 25 or 30 at least in the tartan designer program on our website. So, yeah, he's, he's, not, he's, he's not, very excited. He's not there yet, but he's catching up to you. <laughs> he is he's kind of all in on tartan design so mm. yeah, it's he's, he's he's excited he's a true believer so cheers to you matthew and uh if you're uh up in philadelphia i i i would happily go to a phillies game with you i cannot say that i will be able to protect you but i will go with you oh. and observe the carnage philly fans aren't that bad <laughs> not at all so anyway cheers Pull a prank on him, take him to a Reading Phillies game. <laughs> mm. Mm. Indeed, indeed. That's it. Phillies fans aren't bad. Now, like Eagles fans, yes. Flyers, eh, mm. iffy. I don't think. Iffy. I don't think. Uh, the, I'll, I'll rabbit hole. Never mind. I'm gonna drop okay. it. Okay, <laughs> fair. God forbid we have fun on the show and talk about things other than Celtic uh, culture. No, Phil never happened. Fans are just as bad in other places there in Philly. People just remember like one example from 50 years ago to throw in mm. their faces all the time. Mm. No, it's it, Philly's fans are bad. It's it, from and they're an, bad everywhere else is all I'm saying. From an aspect it, of my sister-in-law mm -hmm. is a is a Eagles fan. She mm -hmm. lives in Jersey mm -hmm. and her husband is a Giants fan mm -hmm. and they go to Giants games against the Eagles at Giants Stadium and they come to the Eagles to watch the Giants play down here in Philly. And it is a marked difference how she is treated in Giants country versus he is treated here in Philly. I think that's a stadium full of people who are just interested in sports because it's New York. Part of part of it, potentially, potentially, potentially. Okay. I just I've seen things happen in Philly and it be national news, and I've seen the same thing happen in another city, and it is just quiet because oh, it we fits have a narrative. We yes, there is absolutely a narrative, and we have a reputation. My point is the reputation is earned. It will mm -hmm. get reinforced in the mm -hmm. in the media, but yes, we have a reputation for a reason. I just think there's places that have earned it too and aren't getting any credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> credit, not blame. Credit, indeed. So okay, who was that? Who was the last one? That was me. So right. I think we're on Emma now. You. My turn. All right, uh, I've got a question here from Mark Brody, um, and he says that he is planning to order his first Brody tartan kilt. He wants to know how his kilt maker is chosen. Peel back the curtain a little bit. Okay. Um, I think we have this get to know your kilt maker segment that's yeah. been a little bit popular. So sure. how, how do we go about that? Um, it is a very, very extensive roulette wheel that we mm -hmm. have. We throw the bones. In production, indeed. Um, <clears throat> the, the, I'm, I'm assuming by the way that you phrase that, that the kilt maker is here. We are the kilt maker of choice for Mr. Birdie. Um, the ultimately it depends on the model of kilt. Um, the longer you are here, you move up the ladder. So when you first start off as a, you know, we, we've hired you fresh in the door at USA Kilts as the newest kilt maker. Um, you're going to start making liners and you're going to make sashes and you're going to make things that are very, very simple. Um, and you're going to learn tartan. You're going to learn the fabric and learn how it feels, how it sews, how to you know do joins, how to hem, all those kind of things. Assuming that you probably already know some of those things, but <clears throat> we want to start you off on accessories, and then we move you into casual kilts. And typically, the first thing we do is off the rack kilts. You know, things that are not customer centric. Um, so the and it, when you kind of get your feet under you, then. Actually, the first kilt you make is usually for yourself or for your for your partner um, or for your husband or whatever um, is usually the first kilt you make. Uh, then you kind of move into off the racks. Then you move into custom. After you've graduated custom kilts, so to speak, then you move into semi-traditional kilts. And it's under the watchful eye of one of our team leaders or under Mac. Um, and we are watching every single step of the way and making sure you understand what you're doing. So you're doing one step of the process then getting it checked. And then you're, you know, the next step of the process, then getting it checked. And we kind of train you up. And then we let you do a little bit more of the steps and a little bit more, uh, you know, independent work, so to speak. And then you move up the scale from semi-trad 
to five yard wool kill to our top stitch eight yard wool kill to our premier kill. So if you're ordering a premier kill, you're really only at, at this point right now today, you're gonna get Mac or Susie or Casey or Sophie are the four that we have making our premier kills. If you're doing a five yard wool kilt, then it's any of those plus Haley or Alicia or Clara. Um, if it's a semi-traditional kilt, now we include also Aldana and we include, I think blue is starting to train on those or mini kilts right now. So it's, you kind of work your way up. So that's kind of how it is I won't say how it's chosen, but how it's narrowed down. Yeah. How it is chosen is Mac, <laughs> who yeah. Mac decides is the one to get the kilt. Um, we kind of spread the work out across the different kilt makers. So there's not a particular one that gets all the premieres or all the top stitch eight yard kilts. It depends on what we have, you know, coming down the pike. Yeah. So if we have 50 five yard wool kilts, you know, in Appalachian folklore is going to be coming up in February. Um, when all those hit, it's going to be everyone doing Appalachian folklore for a few weeks to get all of those kilts done um, and less premier or less top stitch eight yard kilts. Or if we have a few rushes, um, you know, we work those into the schedule with whoever has an open slot in their schedule that week. So it's it's really kind of a a, a, a influx what? flow. It's, it's like water. It just kind of flows. And Mac does a very good job, you know, thank God, <laughs> of juggling how all those things work, <clears throat> making sure that the rush orders are done and out the door within the three to four weeks. The, the regular orders are out the door within the eight weeks. Um, anything emergency that Ian runs upstairs with and says, hey, Mac, uh, this needs to be sorted out and done right now. Please fix this. Please adjust this guy's kill. Please make this sash immediately. And we throw different things at him. It's, it's a, a beautiful chaos yeah. in the production team that they are able to have a schedule, but then have the flexibility to be able to drop things and meet things at the drop of a hat if we need something done at a particular time frame. Uh, since I work in customer service, the question, the related question we get pretty frequently is, can I request a kilt maker? Uh, my answer to that, broadly speaking, is you can ask. Put it in a note. We will not ever make a promise that we, we can fulfill because there's so many things beyond whether or not the person can make the kilt, which is obviously relevant. We're not going to give a premier kilt to somebody who's been here two weeks because your your cousin or your your niece started working here. We can't uh, can guarantee the quality. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, th I would say, I could first say, we won't do that because we don't like to put bad quality stuff out in the world. That's fair. Um, but even if, you know, you're, ask, you're getting a five-yard kilt and you know somebody can make it, there's a lot of other things in the ecosystem that affect that. Sure, you may have picked Kilt Maker X, but we have a big project we need them on. So we don't yeah. want to put your kilt off several weeks simply because you wanted that kilt maker. So or in in the uh, 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 in in the instance of Casey, she just had a baby. She just came back yeah. from maternity leave. So if you ordered a kilt, you know, three and a half months ago, and said, "I really want Casey to make this one," do you want to wait five months for your kilt to come up because she's out? Um, and even if your answer to that is yes, we don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's it, we don't want things to languish that long. No. Um, we want to keep things moving at a particular time yeah. frame and keep things going forward. Um, yeah, it's we don't want bad quality. We don't want you know things beyond a reasonable time frame. We try to keep everything high and tight, so to speak, um, and moving forward. And it doesn't. It, it, <laughs> Mac will have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> the man loves to plan things. He is organized as you can get. So if you throw too many different things at him, he may he may start twitching a little bit and you know attack someone. He's pretty good at rolling with the punches, though. <laughs> He's gotten better he, because you guys have gotten better downstairs at being a little bit less. Hey, do this right now. So mm -hmm. it's communication is a key here at USA Kilts and has been on the docket for everyone for this coming year so we're doing a better job at that and he's doing a better job at rolling yeah. with the punches yes so that that's yeah. my answer okay did Ian. It. yes my turn yes your turn okay so we did that one so we've got a question here from a kirk uh Kinaman. I've that before, yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, what are your thoughts on flashes slash elastic garters versus garter ties? 
does one have advantages over the other? But wait, there's more. <gasps> Bill Marshall asked a similar question. Are garter ties becoming more popular these days? Do sales speak to that? Seems like I'm seeing more instances of them. Okay. So there's a lot to chew on there. <clears throat> are, are garter ties easier or more difficult than elastic flashes and elastic garters? Um, I wouldn't say they're easier or they're just different. Um, so garter ties are essentially long knitted strips of you know yarn. So knitted, not woven, knitted. So they stretch a little bit. And then on the end, they have little fringy bits. Um, they, uh, yeah, it's elastic um, will uh, uh, compress and stay compressed. And so if you're maybe diabetic, maybe garter ties, maybe a touch better. Um, or, or if you have an issue with circulation. Um, but I, I would say there's neither are better or worse. They're just different. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on that? Personal preference would play into whether you find them better or worse. I will grant Agreed. that. Agreed. If, you're, if you're sitting here thinking, Rocky's crazy, these are so much better. Personal preference matters. Um, I used to be very solidly a Flash's guy. I didn't care for the garter ties. Um, decided to give them a try maybe like a year or two ago. And I've been, I've been shifting, swinging pretty hard the other way. Um, I do find garter ties can be a little tricky at first. Um, I know I don't tie mine the kind of standard way you see in all the YouTube videos because that doesn't really work for me. Um, I would say if you're getting a kilt for the first time for your wedding and you're not going to be wearing it in advance, maybe don't try garter ties for the wedding. Um, if you're falling down because you didn't tie them successfully, you haven't quite dialed in the process, uh, maybe sticking with flashes would be a better call. But yeah, if you're... Um, if you're if, if if you've already been wearing kilts for a few years and you're looking for some ways to mix it up, I think garter ties are a really interesting way to do that. And and regarding um, Bill's question specifically, well, are they becoming more common? Hold on, nope, okay, not, not done the first sorry. question yet. Sorry. The um, uh, how dare you, sir? Now it's I to tying the garter ties. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the flashes, elastic garters are easy. It's there's a metal hook and a metal clip, done. Yeah. And then there's a little adjustable bit. So they're easy. They're going to fit, period. Um, for for flash or for garters, um, the, the garter ties, um, I've seen like five different ways to tie them. I've seen mm -hmm. people make it, in, in my estimation, again, one man's opinion, um, I've seen people overcomplicate it. I mean, I when I first got them, and I'm kind of in the same camp that you are, that I was very much a, nope. I like flashes. That's my thing. I don't really like the garter ties. And I got a pair and I'm like, ah, I kind of love them. <laughs> uh, so, but, but the first time I tried them on, I was like, I remember, I think Matt Newsom did a video on it and a few other people did videos on like how to tie garter ties. And I'm like, it's a freaking half knot around your leg. How difficult can this be? So the first time I did it, I just, you know, started on the outside of the leg, wrapped it around, did a half knot. And then the only part that I did that was, you know, a little tricky, whatever you want to call it, was I took the the half knot and then I, I wrapped it around or I tucked it under like the first single loop and, you know, folded the, the, the top of my hose down and I have not ever had a problem with okay. it untying or loosening or anything like that. Because you think about it, you have the, the outer layer there to hold it in place so it's not going to really move and as long and it's i haven't had a problem with the cutting off circulation because i'm not you know yanking it super duper tight so i i personally haven't had a problem with any of the the things that people are nervous about happening that haven't worn them before so if you've never worn them give them a shot they're they're, they're not the most expensive kilt accessory um and it's it's not as difficult as you think. You just do a half knot. You know, you tuck it under the thing. You lay it over. You make sure both ends are the same length. That's the trickiest part. Is yeah. you're wrapping it around your leg essentially one and a half times, or you know, all the way around and all the way back, and then doing a half that. knot. So as long as you do that and the ends end up the same, and if they're not, it's not like you're spending an hour and a half. You just undo the half knot. You twist it a little bit. So that one end's a little bit longer, and that way when you twist it over and you do your half knot, they both end up the same length. So I've never had to undo it for this reason. My secret is, you know, I fold it in half, so I find the, the center, and I place that center on the leg exactly where I want it to end. So that when I bring it around the other side and come back, 
and tie it off, they're the same lengths on both sides. Yes. If you just do a half knot and let it set, let it dangle. Mm-hmm. If you do what I did, which is you then tuck it over mm-hmm. the or underneath the other piece to kind of help lock it in place a little bit, then that end ends up shorter than the other end. Oh, I see. So I do have to do it a little gotcha. off center gotcha. for that because of the way I tie them. But it's not rocket science. You're doing a half knot yeah. on the side of your freaking leg. It's like, play with it. It's fine. You'll be fine. As long as it looks the same as a finished product, Yeah, you're good. Now, are There's... they more popular now than they have been? What do sales say? Haven't done a real deep dive on that. Um, we certainly saw a surge when we started carrying them. <laughs> yeah. I, for the record, I resisted carrying them mm. for a long, long, long time. Um, I don't know why I was so anti, but I really didn't want to carry them. Um, I'm like, we already have three levels of flashes. Do we really need another plus tartan thing? Ones. Yeah, plus tartan ones. Do we really need another thing just to hold your freaking socks up? Um, but eventually I kind of, you know, my staff wore me down and <laughs> said, no, oh, when you really need it, I want to buy ton. I want to buy garters. And they were ordering them custom when I would order the hose. I'm like, fine, I'll order some freaking garter ties. And then I got them and I'm like, hey, I kind of like these. Yeah. And I <laughs> so. recently talked Rocky, I'm going to do a little tuck here into bringing in some new colors even. Ooh. A couple, well, like maybe back, back in the summer, we, we added two new colors, purple and gold. Great, great yeah. options for a lot of tartans. Um, yeah, I would say if you're seeing, if you're seeing them more, Bill, was it? No, it was Kirk. Kirk. No, it was Bill. Yeah. Bill was the follow-up question. If you're seeing a more Bill, I would say, if it's in the group specifically, Kilts and Culture and, and, and related groups, I think the guys who are peacocking a little bit are leaning into those more. Certainly some of them are doing flashes too, but they're more likely to be taking photos. They're more likely to be posting in the kilt groups. So I think there might be a little bit of a false positive there because I think flashes are still across the board selling more for sure. I Yes. Yes, but the it's as a percentage. I think we are. I we've only been carrying them for what like three years, four years, so not a huge amount of time. Um, since we've started carrying them, we had the initial bump of you know, oh, you're carrying something new, cool. Um, and they kind of tapered off, but I think there's been a steady rise yeah. in people ordering them. Have they been more popular in flashes? No, but. Have they increased in sales? Yes. I think okay. we've probably doubled the amount of garter ties that we are selling now versus four years ago or 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 so. But we've also so, increased the sales of everything else too, so maybe not at the same rate. Correct. I think as a, as a rate, I think they've gone up faster. I think okay. more people are wearing them. And I think you're right on the money that the guys that tend to like them are the guys who are playing with it. They're just, you know, they want something a little bit different. They yeah. don't want to have the exact same thing, the exact same tartan, the exact same hose colors, the exact same everything else that everyone else has. They want to do, ooh, this is slightly different than the other thing. I'll get the different one so I can be a little bit different. They're trying to stand out in a crowd, even a crowd with a bunch of guys in kilts where matching tartan flashes are going to be reasonably common at least. Indeed. And even solid color flashes are... are but I, I don't think garter ties will ever overtake flashes. I could be wrong about that. But I think you're always going to see more flashes. No, I don't think you're wrong about that yeah. at all. I think flashes will always be the mainstay, the main thing. I still think they will always be at at the height of garter garter ties. Maybe they would take twenty percent to eighty yeah. percent. But it's it's probably ninety ten or ninety five five in favor of flashes. But I think garter ties are kind of on their way up as a little bit of a trend. Yeah. So, indeed. So, hope that helps. Yeah. All right, next question. Go ahead. Okay, so I've got a question here. It's a little bit more ladies aimed, but I think it is a decent one. It's from Bonnie Guthrie, um, and she wants to know, uh, she would love to order a mini kilt, but she's short, uh, she's five foot tall, um, and from what she's measured, the length of her kilt would be 12 inches. There's no option for 12 inches. Can it be ordered when it's 12 is, is the question. Sure. Should it be ordered when it's 12 inches? We can, we can talk about that, <laughs> That's too. That's a different question. <laughs> different question. Also valid. Yes. Um, I'll bring you in in a second. But uh, logistically, 
on the website. The um, mini kilts, I forget what the lowest number is. Like we can 14, make we can make a kilt to whatever length you need, whether it's you know a micro mini or whether it's super duper long. We can make whatever we need to make. We are you know we are kilt makers. We physically make this stuff ourselves. Um, double and triple check <laughs> that twelve inches is the correct length because that is very short. Um, you want to make sure it, now if you're wearing it low, like low rise jeans, then it it, it may be fine. Um, but you want to measure. I would also say back and front. If you have a little bit of junk in the trunk, so to speak, and your you know your posterior goes out and down, that is a longer distance for the fabric to travel than straight down the front. So make sure that 12 inches in the front is not a good length, but 12 inches in the back is a bit obscene, <laughs> potentially. Um, you know, when you bend over or when you squat down, you want to make sure that it's going to cover all the things you want it to cover. Um, but yeah, if you need a 12 inch length, we can make a 12 inch length. Emma, what would your thoughts on this be? Yeah, um, I would say if, if 12 inches is what you're getting, definitely. Um, but I, I would also urge caution. 12 is 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 pretty short for what we typically see. Um, I've measured a lot of mini kilts in the store um, and the front and back thing is, is huge. So sometimes I'll measure a woman in the store and we'll, we'll say, hey, 12 looks good in the front. It's hitting you kind of on the upper thigh. That's what you want. Let's turn to the side in front of our full length mirror. And I'm going to point to you where 12 inches falls on the back. Um, and sometimes that's not even to the leg. Sometimes we're we're way out there. So um, we're way up there. Way up there. Yeah. Way. Up, yeah. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to touch that spot. That's concerning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that is a, a huge tip um, that that we give to ladies in the store when we're measuring them. Um, it, it's to keep that in mind that that you're it's going to fall differently. Um, now, also, if, if you're measuring a kilt that you have, sorry, a skirt that you have at home, like maybe a pencil skirt uh, where it hugs your body and that's 12 inches long and you feel comfortable in that. Um, a kilt is built differently. A mini kilt would be built differently and it'd feel differently on because it is not conforming. It's open in yeah. the back. So sometimes we do have, have ladies who, um, once they try one on of our, the ones we have in stock in the store, it feels a lot shorter than if they have a like 13 inch long tennis skirt, a 13 inch, inch long mini kilt feels yeah. much shorter. You, you get a lot yeah. more breeze. The uh, oval <laughs> shape at the bottom is wider out than that pencil skirt for yes. sure. Yeah, yeah. So I would keep that in mind as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if if you're five foot, I mean, we do have uh, some shorter girls in the store who work and they tend to be a little bit on the longer side still, but they all wear it at the high waist. So the low waist and yeah. high waist is also something to keep in mind for that. Yeah, she's say. wearing it at high up on her waist. That sounds concerning, even at her height. Yeah, 12 inches <laughs> at my high waist would probably be a belt. Uh, yeah. I wear my mini kilts at 18 inches long. That's the longest they can go. Uh, but I wear it at the high waist, and I'm pretty tall. So mm. can't speak from a five-foot foot perspective yeah. here. But, yeah. it's It's been done. We've made 12-inch mini kilts before. That's all I have to say on that. Okay. And that's all I have to say about that. The, the only thing I would point out is <clears throat> it... Measure twice, cut once. It is a custom garment. So if you are unsure, you know, use a a towel or another piece of cloth that you have, fold it over to 12 inches and kind of wrap it around you. See how you like the look of Fish it. Fish towel, perhaps. But you know, <laughs> once a a once a kilt, mini kilt, whatever, is cut to the length, you can't stretch the fabric and make it longer. So be a hundred percent sure that you're all in on the 12 inch length before you order it because it's an expensive mistake to make. So, but yeah, absolutely. Yes, we can do it. If it needs to be done, we can do it, I promise. All right, Ian. Yes. <clears throat> okay, I've got a question from abroad here from Joe Groves. I know the little holes along the selvage are from tenter hooks. Certainly we've addressed that on the show a few times before, but can you work them out? Like by rubbing the area, stretching the fabric a bit this way and that. Or are we just stuck with it? Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> on the very, very bottom edge of the cloth, I'm actually looking at, I can see it on mine right here. Um, there, along the edge of the cloth, you have a little, uh, if, it, if it's a, 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 a kilting selvage, or if it's a selvage edge of the cloth, meaning the natural edge of the bolt of cloth, you have a little zigzag uh, 
zigzag line of holes. So here, 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 that are about a centimeter apart, you know, going up and down. Um, those are what are called, you know, it's, it's an artifact from the weaving process. So the fabric is woven. Once it's done being woven, it's sent to the finishers to be washed and cleaned and what they and stretched to a particular width. So what they do is they actually put the the fabric, you know, they stab it on these little tiny pins that are called tenter hooks. And in doing that, then they stretch the fabric to the appropriate width and then dry the fabric so that it is set at a particular width. Now, those little tiny holes where those pins were inserted in the cloth are left on, you know, they're, they're, they're an artifact of the weaving property. It's, it's on the fabric. And if you're using, like you are with a kilt, the entire bolt of cloth all right down to the very, very edge, if you hold the very edge of the kilt up to light, you'll be able, as long as it's not hemmed, you'll be able to see those little tiny holes right on the edge of the fabric. Now, those holes will not grow. They will not unravel. It is not a flaw. It is just part of the process. Over time, with wear, with natural movement of the fabric, with washing or with dry cleaning in the case of a wool kilt, those holes will kind of shrink up a little bit over time, but they will probably always be there. Um, if you, you know, as, as Joe said, as you kind of twist the fabric this way and that, and kind of pull it diagonally to stretch it, could you work them out? Sure. Um, you could get them to reduce in size a little bit, but I can't guarantee, nor can any mm -hmm. kilt maker, nor can any mill guarantee that you can eliminate those holes. They will probably always be there to some level. And if you hold them up to the light, you can still see them. I mean, this kilt was wet washed um, and I can at least twice and I can still see the tiny holes in there. Ultimately, it is one of those things where, um, and I, I say this from you know personal experience, if you have a little bit of OCD about it, you can find yourself kind of picking over little tiny details like that and letting it get under your skin. You just have to wash day. You just have to let it go. Be like water. And um, to quote Bruce Lee. Be water, my friend. And just kind of let it go. It's part of the thing. It's part of the beauty. It's part of the process. If you look at it through a different lens, a different personal lens, don't look at it as in there's a flaw in my kilt. There's a flaw in the fabric. Look at it as, wow, that was part of how this was actually made. If you look at it in that way and you appreciate it in that way, you start to see it differently. I'm going to draw a parallel. Um, I've gotten, uh, I've, I've, you know, gotten fabric and I've made kilts before for myself <laughs> where there's a little tiny piece of grass, you know, little tiny, little tiny piece spun in with the yarn and it just, you know, through the washing and dyeing process, like it, it becomes like white, but you see a little tiny, what looks like imperfection in the cloth of white kind of spun around one of the, one of the single strands of yarn. And it used to drive me nuts. And I used to work at actually trying to pull it out using a seam ripper, pushing it through and getting, trying to get that out of the cloth. And I kind of evolved in my position of it um, where I'm now looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, you know what that actually was? That was a sheep in a field, either in New Zealand or Scotland or wherever that was rolling around in the grass or had a little tiny thing that got into the sheep's wool. And that little tiny piece of grass survived the combing process, survived the spinning process, survived the, 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 the dyeing process, survived the weaving process, survived all the way through to cloth inspection, all the way through to kilt making. And it is now one tiny piece of grass from across the world that is now on my body as part of my kilt. It is an individual flaw that I've grown to appreciate. It's mm -hmm. it survived that long. Who am I to now pull it out? If you have OCD about it, sure, pull it out. If you have OCD about the tenter hooks, sure, try to work them out. But I submit to you, if you look at it in a slightly different way, as an individual custom garment, an individual custom piece of cloth, 
an individual thing woven and made just for you. And you think about all the hands that literally this piece of cloth have passed through on its journey to you, and you learn to appreciate it in that way, it's actually beautiful. Yeah. And it's not me making an excuse for a flaw. It's me appreciating the thing for the beauty of the thing. How very Japanese of you. They call me that's, nothing if not Japanese. That's, <laughs> that, that's a really nice answer. I like that a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's about the learning process, learning what it took to get you there and, and seeing the hands of the people who worked on it in the work there. I will be a little pedantic on one point. We keep using the word holes. I think holes might make somebody think that we've put holes in your kilt. And that's not exactly what it is because it's woven. You know, you put, when you're sewing, you're not putting holes in the cloth. It kind of is pushing the, the weave aside. So yeah. it's just, it's, it's not that you're not hole drilling put a in. Hole. Yeah. yeah. Not like that, like you would for, you know, carpentry. But it is just pushing the, the fibers aside. And then in the process of drying, they dry that way. So, yes, that's why they can be worked out a little bit. A little bit of an iron, especially with steam, will help. Not necessarily going to solve it in one go, Joe. Uh, <laughs> um, washing it will lessen them over time. I think customers are particularly seeing this with the PV. I think because of the way they treat that cloth, it tends to hold mm -hmm, those. Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty rare that somebody not looking for them is ever going to see these in wool. It's, it's rare that they're noticeable even to the kilt maker. Um, and it's yeah, it, especially after it's been washed. Most people aren't noticing these unless they're looking for them. But the PV, I think, it's a little bit more noticeable. Yeah, the PV, I will I will say this. In the PV, um, they tend to be, when you can see them, they tend to be a little bit more, um, like, pressed in. So it's it's yeah. a little bit more of a, like, a cone-type thing. Yeah, like you can feel minuscule. the texture. Yeah, you can feel it versus just seeing it. Um, the wool, now, you're not generally going to feel it. Correct. Now, if you take a steam iron and kind of go along it, you can get them to relax a little. What you're mm -hmm. really trying to do is get the fabric to relax. Think of it this way. It is woven cloth. So the, the things are individually woven in there and you're putting a pin right in the center of it and then pulling it apart. So you're, you're doing like the, the here's Johnny um, <laughs> between two individual threads. Yes. <laughs> a shining reference within the thing um, so you're you're literally pulling apart those two threads so it's if you steam it you're what you're trying to do is get them to just kind of relax so if you can get them to relax through either you know pulling the fabric this way and that or in steaming it you can get it to lessen but it may never actually physically 100 percent go away but again i i would say i would phrase it a different way if you have no one is going to notice this but you. Mm -hmm. The only other person that's going to notice it is going to have to be six inches away from the hem of your kilt. Watch out for that person. And if they're six inches away from the hem of your kilt, they're either invited <laughs> and they're not going to be looking at the bottom of your kilt or they're uninvited. And what the hell are they doing six inches from the bottom of your kilt? If you're going to so, check out these holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awkward situation. So ultimately, it's really not that big of a deal. Don't let it be in your brain that big of a deal. It used to be, and I speak from experience, it used to bother me. But as I kind of evolved in my thinking about it, you just get to the to see it in a different light, in a different way. And you just kind of let go of your of your worry and your concern about it because it's not going to get worse. It's not going to get, you know, it's not going to get bigger or anything like that. It's going to relax over time. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Here ended the lesson. All right. That was you. Emma, we'll do one more from you and then one more from me. In. Okay. All right. Um, I've got maybe a little bit of a fun one uh, since we had Matthew Moreland talking about all the tartans he's been designing. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question from Carl Taylor. And Carl really wants to know, if you could design a tartan after an ice cream flavor, what Ooh. would you pick and what colors would you add? Hmm. Hmm. I can take, we'll, I can take we'll the helm on this one. We'll leave this in for you. One. I, I have one and I'll, but All you right. go ahead. All right. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm going to clear the air that I don't 
like this ice cream flavor. Uh, so okay, don't, don't this is an interesting in, strategy. In, in the comments. So you're going um, strictly for fashion sense. I'm going for fashion okay. sense. I'm going for the story behind this. Okay, okay. As a, a fellow tartan designer in the mix here. Oh, <laughs> look at you. All right, all right. Um, I'm here. And uh, so I, I like the story of tea berry ice cream. Okay. Very local. Maybe a, a micro flavor, yeah. if you will. Um, get some purples, some pinks, some creams yeah. in there. Really be interesting. Okay. Just a, a, a nice uh, tea berry. Maybe a green, like a soft, like a green yes. a green tea kind of vibe. To yeah. on. Okay. If, if Jace is watching right now, he's making a very nice face. He's very pleased to hear that you say this. <laughs> it's a good okay. Jace's face. Yeah. Okay, so tea berry for Emma. Tea berry. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's an interesting choice. And what would your, your ice cream flavor be? I'm not going to go that way because I'm not the biggest fan of pinks myself. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with a, an ice cream that I really like. I'm going to go with a coffee ice cream because I actually liked coffee ice cream long before I drank coffee. Um, I like browns. I wear a lot. I'm not wearing any today, actually, but I do tend to wear a lot of brown. Okay. So, so, so but coffee ice cream is like one solid It is. Color. That is the problem. I mean, maybe you get some chips in there. So you get some dark brown in addition to your light brown. Still two colors. You failed. Yeah. It's a yeah. horrible tartan, dude. It's it's potentially not great, so yeah, I don't know. But maybe maybe okay. you can pick your favorite brand of coffee ice cream and include their branding colors in there okay. too to kind of okay. kind of okay. expand the range okay. a little bit. Okay. There's ways to cheat this okay. and introduce some more interesting colors. Interesting that your your initial thought is how do I cheat? Yeah, that's it's it's wonderful of you. To, yeah, to be able I'm to cheating cheat. on my diet. Cheating our viewers, yes, indeed. I'm cheating my mm. diet with that coffee ice cream, so see, I might as well cheat on the tart. See, design. I'm I'm gonna go with similar color palette. Okay, Cinnabon ice cream. Okay. I'm going to go with, you know, the the, the cream tans, yeah. creams, the browns, you know, get that that uh, that, you know, the darker brown in there the for the swirl. So, kind of a very, you know, earthy vibe to it. I could see that as a good flavor. Um to do a uh for for tartan design I'm in. Yeah. I, I like the colors here better than I like the tea berry. If it's an ice cream flavor, I'm going tea berry all the way. Because if I'm having Cinnabon ice cream, all that's just gonna make me mad I don't have an actual Cinnabon. I don't doubt it's delicious. It's not going to not be delicious. It's all great flavors for ice cream. But I'm just gonna be like, man, I should have just gotten a Cinnabon. <laughs> I have similar feelings about uh, uh, ice cream cake. I never want ice cream cake. Cake is better, ice cream is better. Why are we messing around with ice cream cake? It's not that ice cream cake is bad, because it's not. It's just sugar and all that stuff. You know what I don't like about ice cream cake? Because <laughs> now we're talking about ice cream cake. Um, a, melts way too fast. Yes. I've noticed that. It's, e it's either too hard or like, it's soup. I like it better when it's a little more melty, though. No, it's, it's either too hard or it's soup. There is no in-between. And two, and it's probably the, the, the icing that they put on it, stains the hell out of your mouth. Oh. So every photo, you go to any birthday party with ice cream cake and take any photos, you got green freaking teeth. That's <laughs> it. Or blue. <laughs> so no, ice cream cake, hard pass. That's no, how you know which you. kids don't brush their teeth well enough though. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's still going to be a weird freaking color. Yeah. Um, any other ice cream flavors that we would do for... Has anyone in the audience yeah. mentioned ice cream flavors that they would make a tartan out of? We've got some 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 interesting options okay. here. Um, we've got uh, Robert Leverton saying that a coffee is bingo. You're spot on there. I think you're designing a tweed more than a tartan. Well, that's fair. That's fair. Mm. But maybe I'm designing the tweed to go with I like your it. I kilt. like it. I like it. Yeah. I yeah. like it. It's making me hungry. <laughs> Jen Berry is saying butter pecan ice cream. Yes. I'm on board. Also in that kind of same um brian graft is suggesting neapolitan for a cursed tartan which is also you know three colors okay and there's one interesting in here it's like matthew moreland would do that for a spurs tartan <laughs> yeah. it's actually just 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 those colors in the equal blocks sorry matthew um, um sean moriarty He's saying that the best ice cream flavor he's ever had is blue corn tortilla ice cream interesting i would it try haunts that. his dreams it was so good Blue corn tortilla ice cream. See, I, I'm here for it only because my, my if you ask me my favorite flavor of ice cream, if I'm going to the ice cream shop, it's the one that I've never had before. I'm always like, oh, interesting. I've never had mm. that before. I'm going to do that. can't think of a good one I've had lately. See, but all, all ice creams are going to be in the like earthy kind of creamy yeah. palette. Whether it's, it's like browns and creams and like even like uh, if you went like orange or peach flavor, it's mm -hmm. still, it, it's it's based in that. So... 
too many are too monochromatic. Yeah. They, they don't all have to be. And too yeah. many are going to be like vanilla based. So if, you, if you're trying to get the proportions to match your ice cream flavor, yeah. I don't like a lot of cream in a tartan. Sometimes a dressed tartan looks okay. That, I don't yeah, own any that. of those, though. No. And I'm not, buy, I, I'm not buying your tartan if you no, design I'm, me a... I'm definitely doing cream as a secondary color. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tweeds. At most. I feel like there'd be more there'd be better yeah. ice cream tweeds than there would. Just because you get the flex of things yeah. like your ingredients. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. That's a very avant-garde question i kind of love yeah. it and hate it simultaneously it's fun more of those for next Indeed. next month all right ian one more one more yes what let's do, do one more paula mclean has asked i've heard that white hose are not appropriate and makes you look inexperienced or novice is this true what about off-white okay cream hose white hose all right <clears throat> the the white hose craze or cream hose craze Kind of started in the 1980s with pipe bands. Thanks a lot, pipe bands. Um, and then from there, it kind of morphed into the tartan hire or the kilt rental industry or kilt rental or kilt hire industry. Um, so to me, and you now and from there, it just kind of grew legs and has continued. Legs. I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Um, I am not a fan of cream hose. I am on record as saying I'm not a fan of cream hose. I have a new thought on why. Hmm. I've never phrased it this way before. They lack personality. Not the person wearing them, but the hose themselves kind of lack personality. When you get into wearing kilts and you start obsessing over the details and you start thinking about your outfit and involving the way that you put things together and the colors that you want to play with or you know the shirt that you want to match with the kilt, or you have multiple kilts, and you have multiple browns for your spore, and all this kind of stuff, you start thinking about color theory and things in a different way. And in, so far, in, in that vein of thinking, cream hose are kind of boring to me. It's, it's not interesting. It's not, something, it's not something I want to go to dinner with and talk about. Um, but you can do so many more interesting things so in my mind, why pick the the most or the least interesting option for your hose? I would rather do, you know, a a a color to match, you know, or to pull out one of the different colors in the kilt, or a color to match your jacket or the top that you're wearing, or a, I would do two tone kilt hose. But I would rather do something interesting with the hose to play with it a little bit and do something different, and not just. Ah, white because it matches everything or white because it's, you know, you know, boring or I couldn't make up my mind or it matches everything. So that's the one I want to wear because it matches everything. I would rather do something a little bit more interesting as a, as a conversation starter. I'd even rather, and I can't believe this is about to come out of my mouth. I'd even rather see a pair of red hose, which I still hate, by the way, um, a pair of red hose, like bright red, than cream hose. Are you that hateful, I don't spiteful? Of I, your cream hose. I don't go as strong as you, but I also don't wear cream hose. Cream or white, for that matter. Um, I won't go so far as to say that the people who wear them have no personality. I didn't say <laughs> the people have no personality. I said cream hose have no personality. Um, I think I, I'm a near daily kilt wearer. And as such, I go I wear my hose a lot. So in that regard, they're just going to get dirty. They're going to look They're, they're going to look dingy after not too many wears, and that makes them not a good value for me. Um, I can appreciate for very formal wear, sometimes offsetting the white in the shirt is fine, and, you know, certain types of hoity-toity events, you kind of, white gloves kind of attitude, I wear white because I don't get dirty like those peasants. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the type of life I live. So I, uh, not that I'm, not that I'm, you know, he's actually a slob. He <laughs> not that spills I'm, on everything. Not that I'm in my kilt cleaning out the barn either, but, um, yeah, I just, I'm not, I'm never going to wear cream hose. I'm not as hateful and spiteful as some, um, but they're never going to be for me. Emma, are cream hose for you? Do you like cream hose? Um, interesting. So I, I do occasionally wear cream hose i've never worn cream hose the the coloration issues would be like after a few wears would, would start to grate on me i would say but um 
when I'm putting together an outfit in the store, I don't tend to be so hateful, <laughs> um, so awful to, to the cream hose sympathizers out there. Um, it's it's not terrible. I, I, I do like cream hose in one scenario. I like when you're decked out in your full pre PC, and you've got the brogues on, you can see mm -hmm. the contrast of the brogue laces against the hose and you get this like full, almost like if you took a picture from, you know, so many years ago and you're standing right there, you look just like that. Um, I think that's mm. really cool. Not just like that. You look close to that. You look cool, you know? <laughs> the, I, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down on the contrast thing. I think that's a, it's a very good point. I agree. I think you can get just as good contrast with a good pair of colored hose though. Like an ancient blue with that tartan, you get a fair amount of contrast to your black shoes. I, you can get a fair amount. You yeah. can't get the same amount. Black no. and white are the literally the furthest apart you can get for contrast. So I've heard. Um, yeah, the um, but you can. I agree. You could still get a reasonable amount of contrast yeah. in in ancient blue or ancient green or or uh, like oatmeal, like a stone kind of color. I think would be nice on like a weathered tartan or something like that. So I think you can still attain the contrast to your point, which I think is valuable. Um, and I like that better than, I like having some contrast with uh, with Gilly Brogues than like black. Black, it just, you know, you might as well be wearing just regular wingtips. Um, so interesting, interesting side point. Very nice. I still hate cream hose. Still yeah. wouldn't do it. Formal or not. Um, but the contrast is a very good point. Contrast is good. If I was going to try to, and maybe I wouldn't do it with this this kilt, I'd want a kilt that maybe had some cream in it, even if it was just a subtle white stripe. What about like, so black shirt, white tie, white flashes. White flashes. I could, a fair amount of contrast. I could, I could see. I've heard that white and black are pretty opposite. I, I've heard that as well. Uh, a wise man once said that. Um, I can see white flashes. It still wouldn't be my go-to because it's Same. a bit, it's a bit much, yet at the same time boring. But it's but it's different because you don't see them a lot, so maybe it could work. Um, Especially if you had a dress tartan on, perhaps. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But I think I would still probably pick a, a, a secondary color in it, not white. I totally agree. Yeah. Okay. All right, boys and girls, question of the day. Cream hose. <laughs> are they Satan spawn? <laughs> or are they mildly acceptable if you're one of those people? Let me know in the comments. If you like cream hose or hate them as much as this guy, I'm very curious to know. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, boys and girls, Slajava. Remember, folks, spay and burn your pets. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Really? <laughs> I thought for sure that was for the blooper reel. <laughs>